Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. Thank you. When most people think of Washington, D.C., they think of this beautiful place full of monuments. But there's also another side to D.C. A place of overgrown weeds, strewn trash, and abandoned buildings. And back in 1971, things were even worse. The D.C. area was a hotbed of tension. Many buildings were still burnt out shells from the 1968 race riots. Protests of the Vietnam War were on a rise. Police had their hands full with the largest mass arrest in history, with over 12,000 jailed. It was the perfect time for someone to get away with abducting and murdering a series of girls. And that's exactly what they did. This goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. And the serial killer known as the Doodler. There could be a serial killer in Chicago. A Long Island serial killer. Phantom Killer. Jack the Ripper. The Oakland County Child Killer. The Atlanta Murders Case. The Freeway Phantom. Frankfurt Slasher. Four children have now been murdered. He has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Fifteen brutally murdered young women. The 24th victim. The pattern is the same. One by one. The death count started rising. Serial killing. I think it's at epidemic proportion. A man in a mask robbed, tied, and stabbed them. Strength stuck in her lap bags. Disemboweled in this alley. It is highly unlikely that these women were murdered by separate men. Where will the killer strike next? They still do not know who's responsible. They kill simply because they like it. Serial killers keep killing. Police can't answer who or why. That's the question that we'll never know. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering if this person's going to be caught. I hope they'll get answers one day. I believe that there's someone out there that has knowledge. Zodiac said he shall never be caught, and he's probably still at large. We start in the Congress Heights neighborhood of townhouses on the D.C. Maryland border. It is where 13-year-old Carol Spinks lived with her mother and her two sisters. She was described as quiet and timid. Her best friend was her twin sister. And on the afternoon of April 25th, Carol was home alone with two of her sisters when their older sister, who lived next door, asked one of them to go to the store for her. They knew they weren't supposed to go alone, but Carol relented and left. And this is where I want to make an interjection. While researching this case, I used a number of sources and noticed a frustratingly large number of discrepancies with even just simple facts. For example, this is the common address that shows for Carol's house. However, the investigative discovery show reports she lived a block over in this apartment complex. In these instances, I have chosen what the majority of sources stated. On her way down to the nearest 7-Eleven, Carol ran into her mother, who scolded her and said they would talk when she returned home. Today, the 7-Eleven is now the Shell gas station. When questioned, the clerk confirmed that they did see Carol enter and leave the store, but she never made the half-mile walk back home. The overwhelmed police didn't take them seriously, saying Carol probably ran away. That would all change six days later when a group of children playing near this now-abandoned housing complex found her body. Carol was badly bruised and scraped. She had been sodomized and strangled. The coroner's report determined that she had been kept captive for at least several days before being killed. Two months later, 16-year-old Darlenia Johnson left her home that used to be located here, where this apartment complex now stands. She walked north toward her job at the Oxen Hill Recreation Center. Darlenia lived less than a quarter mile from the Spinks home and had about the same distance to walk to work as Carol did to the 7-Eleven in the opposite direction. Another missing persons report was filed, and a witness claimed to see Narlenia in an old black car driven by an African American. In the weeks following her disappearance, Darlenia's mother began receiving a series of disturbing phone calls of heavy breathing. But then, one final call came. On the other end, a man's voice said, I killed your daughter. Eleven days after her abduction, her body was found yet again behind the St. Elizabeth's Hospital, just 15 feet from where Carol Spink's body was dumped. Okay, so he went to the exact same spot, exact same spot. He's driving down the road, he's uh, looking for a place to pull over, he's maybe driving down, looking down, and suddenly he sees he can't go any further. And so he just stops, he pulls up, he's able to like stand here, throw the body over, and he's hoping nobody's gonna find it. So the 
first two, he's trying to hide the bodies. It was determined that she had been there for quite some time, even though the police received a phone call the week prior saying where the body was. Like Spinks, she had been strangled and was dressed except for her shoes. Due to the decomposition, she was only identified by matching her clothes to the missing persons report. Two weeks later, on the other side of town, 10-year-old Brenda Crockett left the store for her mother. My mother had sent my sister to the store. She expected her to go and come right back because the store was just around the corner. He sees a girl in his neighborhood. He may know her. He may have some kind of connection with her. He's able to talk her into the car. After she failed to return home, her family, now panicked, left to search the neighborhood, leaving her seven-year-old sister home on lookout. They, too, received a phone call. This time, it was Brenda herself. My sister called home. I remember her saying that someone had gotten her, snatched her, and said they were going to put her in a cab and send her home. Crying, she stated that she had been picked up by a white man and was heading home in a cab from what she believed was Virginia. Shortly thereafter, she called yet again to repeat her statement, but this time saying she was in a house with the white man. When asked for him to come to the phone, heavy footsteps were heard and the phone call abruptly ended. The following morning, a hitchhiker was standing on the road near the off-ramp of U.S. Route 50 when they noticed a shoeless corpse in the brush. It was Brenda Crockett. Yet again, she had been raped and strangled, a knotted scarf left wrapped around her throat. This time, the body was strangely washed, in particular her feet, which were scrubbed clean. Green fibers from either a rug or a car were found on her body, the same type of fibers that had been found on Carol Spinks, a link was starting to be suspected now. Then things were quiet for two months until October 1st. Ten-year-old Nanamisha Yates left her apartment where she walked down the road to pick up some grocery items. Today, the Safeway is gone and the KIPP DC Academy stands in its place. The Safeway clerk confirmed that Nanana Misha had purchased her items in the store and left, but she did not make it home. Her groceries were found laying on the sidewalk. Now, not even three hours later, the girl's body was found by another hitchhiker along the side of Pennsylvania Avenue near the Cedar Hill Cemetery. She had been strangled so strongly that her esophagus was broken. Yet again, she had been raped, and yet again, green fibers were found on her. Police could now no longer deny the connections, and the FBI stepped in to help investigate. The community was wrought with fear, and the press now reported the crimes attributed to a single name, the Freeway Phantom. That's when the press picks up on the fact that, hey, we got a problem here, and they dub him the Freeway Phantom. Now he's got a name. This was the first time we had ever had anything like this, so we were totally, totally unprepared. The term serial killer, or mass murder, all this stuff was not even thought of at that time. This is Cardozo High School. It started life back in 1882 as the first high school for the city. This current building was built in 1917, and in 1950, it became the segregated school for African Americans. It also happens to be right in front of Brenda Crockett's home, and in the evening of November 15th, 18-year-old Brenda Woodard finished up her night class here. Next, she went south to Ben's Chili Bowl for dinner with a classmate. The two rolled the bus down to 8th and 8th Street, where Brenda got off to catch another bus home. She never got on. This intersection would also be marked by another brutal murder 14 years later when Catherine Fuller was sodomized and beaten with a metal pipe, her body left in an alley nearby. A gang, aptly named the 8th and H crew, were convicted of the crime. However, in recent years, it has been alleged that the confessions were falsified and that a serial rapist may have been the culprit. Back to Woodard. Just hours after she was last seen, a police officer on patrol found her corpse on the side of the on-ramp to Route 202. The, uh, the ironic thing is that it's right next to the bus stop where the victim's mother 
would go every morning to catch the bus to go home. We do know that that morning that uh, the victim's mom did come down here to the bus stop and was forced to walk around and had no idea what she was looking at, but saw all the commotion in the police cars before she went to the bus stop. She even walked by where Brenda's wig had been discarded down the road and remarked at how much it looked like her daughter's. The Phantom's murder method was far more sadistic this time as well. In addition to strangulation, she had been stabbed six times and had defensive wounds which indicated she had tried to fight her attacker off. The stabbing and the fact that she had her shoes on made investigators think it may have been a separate incident, except that in her coat pocket they found a note. It was determined that the note was written by Brenda herself at the behest of the killer, and due to the fact that Caucasian hairs were found on her body, it is unknown if this was a copycat or the phantom himself, while the same green fiber was found on her. One strange note, before Brenda's mother would learn who she had seen, the police made a mannequin up to resemble the unidentified corpse in hopes that someone would identify it. Today, a roadside cross sits not far from where the body was found, though this is likely for a more recent car accident. After Brenda Woodard, things went silent into 1972. I think the reason he stopped after Brenda Woodard for a while was because he made a mistake. What that mistake is, I do not know, but Brenda Woodard pushed him to the brink that he strangled her and he stabbed her. That's, that's truly overkill. Perhaps the FBI's involvement scared the killer off. Maybe people could rest easy. And they did, for a time. We have a mystery story out of Washington. Five people have been arrested and charged with breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in the middle of the night. The Democratic National Committee is located in the Watergate office building. Neither the president, obviously, or anybody in the White House or anybody in authority in any of the committees working for the re-election of the president have any responsibility for it. Washington was now plunged yet again into confusion after the Watergate scandal, and all FBI agents had been pulled from their cases to focus on that. If you wanted to be a criminal, this was the time to do it, because all the police were pretty much tied up. Seventeen-year-old Diane Williams left her house after dinner and took the bus stop to her boyfriend's house. My sister and I shared the same bedroom and the same bed, so we were very close growing up here. And she would, you know, look at my palms and, and read my palms and tell me because I had a broken line in my palm that, and she didn't, that she would live a longer life than I did. She left her home and was confirmed in bed dropped off at this bus stop, needing only to walk about 1,800 feet back home. She never made it. It was, it was like late morning. We got the, the paper, yeah, and think. my sister Debbie started reading the paper about the body being found on 295. The next morning, a trucker pulling over on Interstate 295 found her body near the on-ramp. She had been strangled and her shoes removed. Though she was not sexually assaulted, semen was discovered on her clothes. When she started reading description of what the, the, the person was wearing, we just all knew that it was Diane and we just all broke down in here. We were here about the girl being found somewhere on a highway or uh, wherever and she would say, um, that would never happen to me. Officially, Williams is the final known victim of the Freeway Phantom. However, there have been several others that were suspected, including 18-year-old Tiara Bryant, who was found dumped near a freeway bridge. She had been strangled just two months after the Phantom's last murder. She is not considered an official victim simply due to lack of evidence. Then there was 14-year-old Angela Barnes. She was found shortly after Darlenia Johnson on a rural Maryland road shot to death. Her case was quickly solved when it was found that two ex-cops had committed the act. Another gang of suspects were known as the Green Vega Rapists, who were known to abduct and rape women in their car in the same vicinity as the Freeway Phantom. An imprisoned gang member implicated the gang in the murders, but his information was eventually discredited. In 1974, the FBI got involved yet again, and this time they were able to find a suspect, Robert Askins. 
Askins was an ex-convict with a number of similarities to the Freeway Phantom. He had a victim call their home with false information like the Crockett murder, and it also had another write a note how Woodard was forced to write her Phantom's note. Furthermore, the unusual word that appears on the note, tantamount, was known to have been used frequently by Askins. At the age of 19, Askins was attending college where he served drinks laced with cyanide to five prostitutes, which resulted in the death of one, and later stabbing another prostitute to death before he was arrested and taken to a hospital for observation. While there, he tried escaping and wounded three orderlies before being caught. He was found criminally insane and committed to St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital for 14 years. St. Elizabeth's, or St. E's as it is known locally, first began in 1855 as the first government-funded psychiatric hospital in the United States. At its peak when Askins was committed, they had over 8,000 patients. Eventually though, as the practice of deinstitutionalization became commonplace, the hospital was transferred to a private system before the campus was abandoned. Using geographic profiling, the FBI was able to theorize that the hospital was a place of significance for the killer, as it was the exact epicenter for his crimes, and even the first two bodies were dumped just beyond its grounds. In a time before patient confidentiality, investigators had access to all records and scoured the violent patients, looking for those who were unaccounted for during the crimes. While he was there, Askins was given insulin shock treatment before being released in 1952. Just five months later, he strangled a middle-aged woman before being arrested for several other assaults. He was sentenced to prison this time, but released in 1958, and by the 1970s had a job as a computer technician at St. Elizabeth's, the very hospital he was locked up in earlier. But his violent tendencies could not stay buried. And in 1977, he abducted a 24-year-old, raping and beating her at his home here. He also did something that lured the police to him as a suspect. He made her write a note and then made her wash herself clean before letting her go. He did the same thing to another woman before he was caught. While investigating his home, they found some disturbing evidence. A collection of women's scarves. Various pieces of women's jewelry and buttons were found around his car as well. He was given a life sentence for the two recent abductions, but denied any knowledge of the freeway phantom. Police could not connect his hair to the hair found, nor could any green fibers on Askin's possessions be linked. He died in 2010. Just one year before, DNA evidence from the Diane Williams case was finally run. It did not receive any hits. Today, the case remains open, but investigators have an even more difficult job of solving it. Almost all the evidence and files were destroyed due to a screw-up in the D.C. Police Department. A Prince George's County spokeswoman says the department is still actively investigating these murders. But in D.C., a spokesperson says these cases were purged years ago. They are no longer active investigations. Much of the D.C. evidence has been lost or misfiled, and it's not clear if there's enough left to even recover the killer's DNA. If the freeway phantom was Robert Askins, then the D.C. community can rest easy. But what if he wasn't? In 1986, a series of five black females were found killed in Suitland, Maryland, just across the border from Washington. The victims were all from the very same neighborhoods as the phantoms. The Suitland slayings stopped after the arrest of a suspect in another murder, but he was never convicted for those slayings. Is it possible that the freeway phantom and the Suitland slayer are the same? If he is alive today, it is estimated that the Phantom could be in his 70s, which means he very well still may be out there, driving the streets of Washington, D.C. right now. I would love for this individual to come forth, and don't be glad to put the handcuffs on. I hope she's okay. I'm sure she is. I pray all the time. I wish that the freeway phantom murder would just come and turn himself into me. Man, we know who it is. They're always with me. I always think of these young ladies. I, you know, it's, it's 
It's just something that's ingrained in me. It's something that's a part of me. When I would want him to come out and say, I did it. Someone just did it and got away with it.